This above all to thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night of day thou canst not be, then be false to any man. And that's Shakespeare from Hamlet. And I'm quoting him not to be pretentious, even though it is. <laughs> um, and I'm quoting it not because it's related to what we're talking about today, even though it is. I'm quoting Shakespeare because the first time I heard this quote, I was like, um, I sort of get what that means, I guess. And I had to think and I had to sit and I had to ponder and I had to kind of translate for myself to get what it meant. And nobody I know talks like Shakespeare. I don't go to Ren Fairs. Um, I, it's not a language I'm familiar with. Even in Shakespeare's time, nobody really talked like Shakespeare. I mean, he's famous for making up a lot of his own language. And the reason why we don't talk like Shakespeare anymore is because language evolves. Language changes. The reason why Shakespeare talked like Shakespeare is because language evolves and language changes. But if you were to take a cross section of most of the magazines that you see today or listen to any of the talk radio programs, on the radio today, you would think that all language that we have access to is pretty much the same. We have, of course, different languages, as in we, you will find French, you will find Spanish, but the structure of the sentences within each of those, it seems like, yes, this is the way it goes. And if you talk to editors, you would think that our language is really written in stone. And I want to talk about this because this is an issue that impacts any way in which we publish language via spoken word, radio, film, and especially in print. I regularly <coughs> advise new writers, especially new writers from diverse backgrounds, underrepresented writers. That's where I focus most of my time and attention, the people who don't usually have access to that kind of insider knowledge of published writing. And what I find very often is they can't even get through the door. From the very beginning, the thing which makes their voice necessary is the thing that stops them from being published. I have worked with immigrant writers who are, whose voice is desperately needed when we're talking issues of immigration. And I, I live in Seattle, so right now with all of these you know, grotesque and horrifying new laws and you know, the intensifying of our immigration services to deport people, more than ever we need to be hearing from immigrants. But try to be an immigrant and pitch a story on it. Try to navigate a language barrier, not even a language barrier, just a different language style, maybe a different sentence structure. And try and, get, try and get anyone to even open your email, to even reply back to you, to ask for more information. And if you do even get through the door, if you do get an acceptance on your pitch or your submission, chances are you face even more struggles. I'm, I'm a writer who was fortunate enough to really come up in the social media age. And I wouldn't have a career if it weren't for social media. Because I was able to bypass all of the gatekeepers of language in order to start my career. I was able to go directly to an audience, find an audience. And then the editor is kind of caught up to what the audience already knew. Right. By the time I was published in a lot of these places, I had more followers on Twitter than the publications had, and then they were just kind of like, I want a piece of whatever that is. Right. But if I had pitched them, and in the beginning, I would send out pitches. I heard nothing back. I wasn't going to pitch in a different voice. I was going to pitch in my voice, because that's the voice I was going to write in. And even so, even now that I have a fairly successful career, having 100,000 followers on Twitter, 50,000 followers on Facebook, have a book coming out published elsewhere, I still have to regularly fight editors when I'm writing. And I'll get a piece back with edits and I'll be like, what is this sentence? 
they'll say, well, you know, it wasn't really, under, it wasn't really clear. I don't think our under, audience is going to get it. I'm like, you know, you, you hired a black writer. And I'm going to talk like a black person. <coughs> and if you wanted that, which is what you said you wanted, is what my readers want, then you should understand that this is what it's going to look like in the end. I have, I have a, a good friend who's a very talented and incredibly popular writer, has multiple best-selling books. And she gets skewered, skewered by reviewers when her books come out for her writing style. It's too casual. It sounds like she's writing on a blog. It sounds like she's just hanging with her homies. There's so much weird coded language to say. This it does not meet our standards of language. Now, it's meeting the reader's standards. She's a best-selling author. But the gatekeepers, who feel like someone should have checked with them first, don't like it. Now, this is something that's really easy to fall into, especially now with the internet. It's so easy to feel like you're contributing if you can correct someone's grammar. <laughs> you can add in, there's even this horrifying bot. I threw the biggest fit over nothing, but I was still so frustrated the other day because I was on Twitter and I was talking about a really, really important subject having to do with social issues. And someone had built a Twitter bot that just comes in to correct your grammar and leaves. And it was like, um, and, it, and it's a bot that picks up bits of your sense. And so it was like, oh, you think that's egregious? Your use of there and there is egregious. And then like left. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I was like, burn it down, burn it down. And it's very easy for people to feel like, you know, they're contributing to some great amount of language. But having a sentence structure that was approved of arbitrarily by someone in some university and some guide a long time ago, it's not necessarily a creative achievement. Now, the weird thing is, is nobody tells me that I'm not going to get anything out of Shakespeare. Nobody says, well, you have to take a little time muddle through. You're going to have to take some time to try and understand what he's actually saying. No one says, don't do it. It's not worth it. If he had something good to say, he would have put it in clear paragraphs. <laughs> he wouldn't have made up some new words. Nobody tries to really, you know, I mean, I'm sure you've read, have you, anybody ever looked at like Shakespeare, the, the like Cliff's Notes for Shakespeare? You can't read that and actually feel like you've got a lot out of Shakespeare, right? There's a reason why that's not the popular thing. That's literally for your kids who just didn't read it and their papers do tomorrow, right? There's a reason why that's not more popular than Shakespeare. Because we leave it enriched, <coughs> right? We leave it enriched not only because of the quality of the story, we leave it enriched because we also come away with new ways to tell a story. Oftentimes we read these things and they stretch us. And because we stretched to meet it, we now know that there are more ways to say what we need to say. And we take that and we build upon that. And we're better for it. And so a lot of times I really want to ask people, when you're reading and everything sounds the same and everything is crisp and clear and easy. What opportunities for being enriched are you missing out on? What opportunities to stretch your own comprehension are you missing out on? And if you work in editing or publishing, this is not only what you're missing out on yourself, but it's opportunities that you're denying your readers. Do you all know who Rachel Dolezal is? Rachel Dolezal. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, okay, some of you don't, which means oh, I'm going to have to explain who she is. Not because it's, she's just awful. Um, <laughs> Rachel Dolezal is a woman who became very famous um, for pretending to be black, even though she's not. And she was a local member, leader of the NAACP. Um, 
And then she was outed by her own parents as having, as being white, as having always been white. Um, and it was a huge scandal. And for the last two years, all of American media has been absolutely obsessed. You can't get anyone to actually write about a black woman. But for two years, they will write anything Rachel Dolezal says and does. Um, and it was a, when it first broke, I wrote a piece or two, just kind of trying to explain, like, hey, um, yeah, no, it's not, because a lot of people were like, well, this is great, you know, white person can be black. And I was trying to explain how that actually works. And unless, you know, the cops are, you know, stopping you for no reason all the time, chances are you're not actually black. Um, and then we were hoping it would go away, and it didn't. And then she came out with a book. Um, <laughs> and it was great, too, because my book was coming out around the same time, and so I had a lot of people going, oh, look like Rachel beat you to it. You know, a lot of funny jokes, haha. -ha. Um, <laughs> and then she changed her name because she said she was having trouble finding a job as Rachel Dolezal, so she changed her name to Nkechi. Omari, which by the way happens to be my sister's name. So it was just, <laughs> it was very frustrating. And it was something that I, that personally was harming a lot of other black women who were feeling like their entire racial identity and their entire struggle was being filtered through this white woman who never had to go through it. And then it became about her struggle because she was no longer accepted as a black person. And by the way, the only reason why anybody ever bought it was because she lived in a town that had like five black people. And so she, you know, she got some braids, and they were like, oh, you're black. Um, I agreed after two years to go interview her. I didn't want to. I really didn't. I was actually thinking, like, what if I broke my leg? And then I could, like, I was trying to find a graceful way to get out of this piece that, like, my publication had invested. Like, they flew me out there, you know, I was like, OK, what's a good way to not have to do this? Um, because the last thing I wanted was to do something that was going to contribute to a harmful narrative. And I didn't know how it was going to go. And I had read her book, and her book was awful. Um, she was comparing herself to slaves. It was just not a good, a good thing. And I went out and I interviewed her for like six hours. <coughs> and luckily, she did provide a lot of new insight, at least to what had been written before. Now, the thing that had frustrated me and so many about this whole debacle was she was almost exclusively interviewed by white people in the full two years. Um, not only white people, white people with absolutely no knowledge of like, you know, racial history, um, no, no, you know, degrees in racial studies, no kind of idea. And so really it was them going, Rachel, tell us what it's like you know, to really know you're black and then to be cast out, you know? And it, this, these were the interviews. And then sometimes she would challenge her and then she would see some real nonsense that sounded like she knew what she was saying about race, and they'd back off. And so it was really frustrating for two years to watch this happen over and over again, and she'd find her way back into the spotlight with just some inane crap. And while the struggles of black women, you know, who in the States, have what, the highest infant mortality rates, highest, you know, second highest to our Native American population, sexual assault rates, right, who are losing their children to our prison industrial complex. Like, none of that was getting headlines. <coughs> so I did this piece and I wrote it, and I kind of wrote what I had discovered, which was that, you know, her entire identity was a function of white supremacy. And I broke it down, and I actually got to ask her questions that she was able to avoid for two years. I was able to show that she doesn't really actually have any knowledge of black history. By the way, she was, a, she was a black history professor, but she has a degree in art. Magic, I don't know how that works. Um, and I wrote the piece and I was just glad to be done with it. And it ended up being the most read piece that that paper had ever published. It actually broke the website. Within two days, had like over a million hits. And I was suddenly hearing from editors who had written pieces on her, wondering, you know, what, how is this happening? How is this happening? And I was laughing hysterically because I hadn't done anything that remarkable. I mean, I did have a fantastic editor. But what I had done was I had been a black woman who had spent her life studying race. And those 
how to talk about these subjects. And then I went <laughs> and I talked about what I knew and I interviewed someone from that context and I put it out there. And I said, you know, any of you could have had this. You could have had this. If you had thought for once that a black writer was someone who could have written this article, who could have done these interviews. And I actually heard like, from a couple of really regretful editors who were like, I didn't realize how wrong I had gotten it. Because they were reading it and they were suddenly seeing the whole issue from a different angle. And I said, yeah, that's because you thought that what you needed was to translate this whole thing to the audience. You thought that this complex issue of race had to come through a familiar language, through a familiar lens. And not only did you end up getting bamboozled by a scam artist, but you ended up contributing nothing to the general conversation. Your audience was not enriched. And all those risks you were unable to take ended up being a reward you couldn't get because the audiences responded. And it wasn't just black people responding. Right? I, I live in Seattle. There's like 20 black people. It was plenty of white people going, I had no idea. And they were able to stretch. And when they couldn't understand fully what I was saying, they were able to Google. <laughs> they were able to like, <laughs> to me to have way. And it ended up being an incredibly successful piece. And it was a piece that was referenced in like New York Times and all these other places as a definitive take on this subject. Now this is an example, and honestly, I'm not even using it to brag. I'm using it as an example for future things because I swear to God, I never ever want to write about that subject again. It was not fun. But because there are so many other opportunities we miss to actually take our stories to the people who are living them. And there's so often I hear people say, I don't think they're a good interview. You know, I don't know if people are going to get what they're saying. And so they'll listen to someone, ask them, what's this like for you? And then they'll try and translate it. And it's all lost in the translation. We have to give our audiences more credit. You know, my brother, Basil, he moved here from Nigeria a couple years ago. And he's a really brilliant man. He's my baby brother. And we were both speaking at a conference on health equity. And he, he has a very broad base of knowledge. Nigeria is very much a place that's like those Renaissance areas where, you know, there's not a lot of jobs. And you go to school for a lot of things. Like if you can't find work, you just keep going to school. <laughs> and, and you try your hand at a lot of things. It, it's a, you know, it, it can be very much, I'm going to try this. And so my, my, my brother has worked on various government projects and different health projects, different community revitalization projects. Then he's worked like in IT. And so you know, he wanted to speak about all of the different ways in which we can build more health equity from kind of this perspective of someone who's had to be incredibly creative on these projects. And he's going through and he's speaking, and he's dressed to the nines because Nigerians are extra, so he's got his full, like, everything's like in brocade, and he has this beautiful PowerPoint. And he's talking and he says, you know, if you do not understand what I'm saying because of my accent, I do not apologize. I work hard every day to not only speak a different language, but to understand what you're saying, and you don't make much sense. If you can't meet me halfway, that's your problem. And then he just kept going. And it was wonderful to see, because I'm so used to people having to apologize. Especially, you know, when we like to say that we are, you know, nations of immigrants. Right? But yet, we still make people apologize for coming with their own experience. And we don't only do this with people who are immigrants. We also do this from people who just live in different, were born and raised in different subgroups in our countries. Right? You get someone in from the Bronx, and there will be somebody complaining about how they talk. You get someone in from Kentucky, there will be someone complaining about how they talk and saying it's not proper. How is the way in which you were brought up to speak your whole life going to not be proper? And if you can understand it enough to correct it, that means you understand it. The work is done. And 
I really liked that thought of expecting the audience to meet you halfway. Because he set that expectation and the audience did. They listened, they were incredibly engaged, they asked a ton of questions. I actually felt like, you know, like kind of bad because I didn't even put together a PowerPoint for that. And he had like everything set up and they were loving every minute of it. Not for the novelty. Like once they kind of got in their head that they could adjust a little bit, they got it. And we do make these adjustments. Right? We make these adjustments for Shakespeare because someone told us it was of value. So when we are deciding what stories to tell, when we are deciding what stories to approach, when we are deciding what writers to work with, what photographers to work with, what musicians to work with, why are we not meeting them halfway? If they're even in our sphere, they've met us halfway. It means that they, meant that they have overcome a ton of obstacles. Because let's face it, the world of journalism isn't really doing all it can to reach out to the talent that's out there. And our audience can meet them halfway and be better for it. So I would love to talk a little bit about some of the ways in which we are currently kind of fulfilling this gatekeeper role and keeping out valuable voices that we may not no. And I think that there are, and I see this not because I want you guys to like feel shitty and be like, oh, I've been doing this wrong. Mm -hmm. But because once you kind of get over that little twinge, there's a lot of opportunity. Those of us who make culture have a ton of power. And that's really what we're doing. We are, we are broadcasting what culture is <coughs> to the masses. So what are some areas, and you guys feel free to like raise your hand and share some that you can think of too from your work. I've worked as a writer and an editor, although I'm a really crap editor, so I, I say that, you know. Um, and I, I find oftentimes that we lack a lot of diversity in who sits in our editing rooms, right? It, it, does, it doesn't do a lot of good to have diverse writers if you don't have editors who can recognize the importance of stories. I mean, you can bypass that. I have some editors who just take my word for it, who do not know half the time what I'm talking about. <laughs> but you know, that gamble has paid off enough times <laughs> that they just do it. I had a really weird situation where, have you guys read that book, If You Give a Mouse a Cookie? It's like a children's book, very, very famous, and it's like, one of those, if you give a mouse a cookie, he's going to want milk. And then if you give him milk, he's going to want a straw. And if you give him a straw, like he's going to, and it ends up being, I don't know, the moral stories don't be nice to mice, I, I guess. <laughs> so I wanted to do, I rarely get to write funny pieces. I'm not a funny person. Um, my brother's a funny person. He took all of the funny and I get none of it. And, but occasionally, like a funny idea will pop in my head and then I just get way too excited. <laughs> Because I usually, I'm the buzzkill of everything. Like every article I write is like, people are happy about this and they shouldn't be. Let me explain why. <laughs> I use the Kardashian Jenners as another class about why we hate them, that we don't really have a lot of reason why, because they haven't done anything to us personally, except for that Pepsi, Pepsi commercial, uh, which was horrifying. But yeah, so you know, if you haven't seen the commercial, basically, you know, we have had in the States, a lot of protests, and actually here in Canada too, I've seen for Black Lives Matter and things like this. And it was basically like using that imagery for a commercial, except for then whichever genre that is, walks up to the cops with a Pepsi can and hands it to them and then they're all friends and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it was, if only true. I know, right? So I decided I was gonna write a play on that if you give a mouse a cookie, and they said it was if you give a cop a Pepsi, and I was very excited about all the disastrous things that would happen if you tried to give a cop a Pepsi in the middle of a protest. And my editor-in-chief, and this wasn't at the establishment, but at a different publication, had never read the book. She was like, I don't know what you're talking about. And I was like, are you kidding me? And then she reached out to my editor and he was like, I don't know, I'm from West Africa, <laughs> I never read this. And I was like, how is it no one knows what this is? 
And they're like, you know what, whatever. And I was so disappointed because I thought it was going to be, I was like, they're going to shit their pants. <laughs> and they were just like, I don't know what you're talking about. And they had to be like, fine, you know what, whatever. <laughs> just, we're going to trust you because you haven't steered us wrong before. <laughs> whatever this, and, and I'm sure if you've never read the books, me saying, what if I did, like it was if you give a mouse a cookie, but it's if you give a cop a Pepsi. And if you've never read the book, I'm sure you're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> but they trusted me and wrote it. And it was a cute piece and most people <laughs> got it. Um, but you know, y you know, I'm lucky enough right, that they were able to do that stretch. And that wasn't even translating cultures. That was just like the two people in our entire state who hadn't read this book. <laughs> but there's so many times where people aren't willing to take a risk. And I get it, right? Especially if you have a fixed budget and you're paying for work. You want to make a safe bet. But safe bets don't grow. I have my career because someone took a risk on me. So many other diverse writers, writers of color, disabled co writers, trans writers, they have their career because someone took a risk on them. And it paid them back in readership, in knowledge, in their own personal enrichment. And we have to be willing to do that. But if you are sitting in the room making decisions with people who look just like you, sound just like you, and have the same lived experience as you, what you're going to often get is confirmation that you don't need to take that risk. That it's not a risk worth taking. And you really should look at editorial diversity not only as the right thing to do, and it is. Oftentimes in writing, the jobs that actually have any chance of regular pay and benefit are reserved for very specific people. But also because it's going to make you a better editor having these conversations. It's going to make the pieces you write better. They're going to appeal to a broader audience. And as I was saying in my talk last night, it will save you from getting dragged on Twitter when you totally fuck up something because you don't know what it is that you're talking about. And you don't know how to save a writer who's really tackling a sensitive issue with another culture in the completely wrong way. Editorial diversity is very, very important. The main reason why my piece on Dolezal worked as well as it did was because I worked with a black editor. Not only a black editor, a black editor who fought for me. Because there was a lot of pressure with the amount of money spent on that piece to make it a certain way. And he fought very hard. He said, no, I know exactly what she's trying to say. We are not steering from this. I know that you want this to be softer. I, want, I know you want this to be nicer. But this isn't a nice story. And it would not have been an effective story if other people had gotten their way if I had worked with anyone else in that piece. In fact, nobody would have asked me to write it. He asked me for a very specific reason, because he knew if his experience as a black man in listening to black women and knowing my work, that this could be a valuable piece. I didn't even see it at first. I would have told anyone else no. And he and one other editor are the only two editors of color I've ever gotten to work with in my career. Actually, no, I got to write for Sachi Cole once, way back in the day. That was fun. She was an amazing editor, too. Um, so look, that is important to look at. And I do know that, of course, we have budgetary concerns, especially when it comes well, to any aspect of publishing. So if you can't currently diversify your editorial staff, are you aware of how not diverse you are? Are you aware of where you are not diverse? Are you aware of the places that may be your shortcomings? Not only in what you're accepting, but what you're seeking out. A lot of times, I have seen people turn down amazing pieces that would have done great just because they honestly didn't know what the subject was. They don't follow that sphere, right? And having hung out with editors, I know a lot of them are Luddites whose job is to look at the paragraphs, look at the words, and say, does this flow? They're probably not going to be up like on what Rihanna's doing right now and why that might matter to the broader culture and why that could be a piece that everyone would be reading. Right? So are you aware of where your shortcomings are and are you coming up with plans to circumvent those? 
Where are you sourcing your talent? Are you just going for the people who already know your name, to the friends of the people that you've already published? Are you just kind of dipping into the same writers over and over again? If you aren't going to other writers, there are, there, are, there are publications that plenty of diverse writers just know aren't for them because they've never made an effort. Right? The publication has never come to where they are. They're out there being expertise on their own lived experience, and they will never hear from some of these publications. And so they would never even think to pitch to them. And if you're out searching for talent and you want compelling stories, I, I will never accept the complaint of, I just don't get submissions from them. Well, what are you telling people that makes them feel like you aren't an avenue? Are your pitch and submission guidelines clear? I, don't, I, I run into a lot of places that don't have any. There is, honestly, there is like this weird, like, I don't know, it's like the secret club of people who know how pitching and submissions work. And nobody wants to tell anyone else. It's almost embarrassing to admit. And then when I first started writing professionally, it was really because people were picking up on my own private work and asking me if they could publish it. So when I had to pitch, I was so embarrassed to say I didn't even know what a pitch was. Like I got it was probably a thing that had to do with getting people to give you money. That's all I knew. You know, like I heard of sales pitches, but I didn't know what a writing pitch was. And I didn't know what the difference between a submission and a pitch was. And no one wanted to tell me. But there were people out there making a career out of it. And it's so frustrating now because I see that time and time again. I actually teach pitching classes regularly because it's the one thing I get more questions on from young writers than anything else. But it's so frustrating to see because every publication has what they're looking for. They, have, they usually have in their brain, even if they haven't formulated a list, and you should, by the way. You should formulate it because you need to know what it is you're looking for. And oftentimes, you, if you don't write it out, you don't really know why it is that you're telling people no. You're just doing enough of a feeling. And you do need to investigate that to see if that's valid and if it needs updating and expansion. But why would you not make it easier for talented writers to be able to reach out to you and give you all of the information that you need to make a decision? I, it's very rare that I come across pitch guidelines. And why would you want to make your own job harder and go through? You could be turning down so many amazing people because they can't write a pitch. When you are reviewing submissions and pitches, are you looking for clues that there may be a cultural or language difference that you will need to navigate? I see time and time again when I hang out with other editors, <laughs> where they're bad-mouthing pitches and submissions because they're clunky or they're, you know, oh my god, I can't believe they call themselves a writer. But you know, you'll find out from subtle clues of location and things like that, like, hey, you know, actually you're just dealing with a language barrier. And the arguments made here are incredibly sound. And this could be an absolutely amazing piece. And you could probably meet somewhere in the middle where they can keep the integrity of their language and you can kind of make it maybe a little more accessible. And you come up with an amazing piece. But right now, what you're doing is you're just kind of mocking somebody and dismissing them when just a little bit of investigation, a little bit of pause could have said, no, you know what? There probably is a really clear argument here. I'm the person that's not getting it because I'm expecting it to look a certain way. I have. It's, it's refreshing to me, no, Anna, someone who writes on social issues, to see the amount of people who, when I hear them talk and I read like their Facebook posts and they're so amazing and they cut to the point of these huge issues and they could be an essay and I can't get anyone to publish them because people don't like their Senate structure or some of the slang that they use and they just, they're dismissed. If you are writing about cultures and groups outside of your own, if you are interviewing people from other groups and cultures, whose language are you centering? And who are you centering? So often I see 
these stories that are people think they're doing such a great thing of bringing awareness to issues or just even these wonderful thought pieces on different groups, marginalized populations. And the person centered is often this writer who is a tourist for a day. And it's not, let me show you these people. It's let me show you what it's like to be me seeing these people. It's very frustrating to read about complex social issues that are primarily impacting one segment of the population and not actually hear any words from that segment of the population in the piece. Even if you're not talking about publishing writers, if you are interviewing a population it's not your own. Their voice should be the voice you hear more than your own. Not translated, not filtered. They're doing you a generosity by opening up their experience to you. You respect that by putting it out there as is. You know, a tough word here or there, you might add what that word means. But audiences respect that as well, and they do that work. And I think we have to remember, those are opportunities for us to grow, not only for our readers to grow, but for us to grow, and for us to redefine what truth is, what journalism is, what writing is. So much of this was arbitrarily defined. And we have to let it evolve. We have to let people shape this world in their own image, in everyone's image. Only certain people right now in our population get to do that. Right? There's a reason why Shakespeare is lauded. But plenty of other writers of color are not for doing the same thing. Only certain people are empowered to redefine our language. And if you have any bit of that power, I suggest that you create a little bit of anarchy and you take a little risk. I mean, the truth is, unless I'm sitting with people who are doing remarkably well, we don't have a lot to lose by taking risk, right? We're all kind of strapped. <laughs> We're all kind of desperate. <laughs> We're all kind of trying to figure out how to stay afloat. What are we going to lose by taking a risk? Are we going to lose our multi-million dollar investors? No. I mean, you can give them to me. <laughs> I'll take some of them. Exactly. <laughs> right now, we have nothing to lose. Nothing to lose. So start trusting in people. We are talking about, you know, kind of broad ideas and I'm sharing like personal experiences and stories, but I would really love to know what y'all are seeing day in and day out and where you're finding opportunities in the work you do that you maybe haven't considered or have been considering as like a maybe for the future and might now be thinking, okay, yeah, this is actually a thing I need to work on. Anyone have any ideas in their work? I wrote this while you were speaking. Take back our voice, take back our language. Don't use the words of the enemy or just the words they want you to. Create your own voice, create your own language, create new words as did Shakespeare. Seed the language with new words. Yeah. yeah. And the truth is, is like, especially marginalized populations are creating words all the time. Right? Oftentimes we haven't been given words on purpose. Right? There's a lot of power in having a word for something. And if you are in an oppressed population, a lot of times words for your oppression are withheld so that you can't talk about it. And so we make up words, right? I mean, that's how words come about, right? So we have words like massage noir, right? Which is, which is the intersection of misogyny and racism that impacts women and femmes of color, right? Um, you know, it's, instead of saying, having to explain over and over again, no, it's not, it's not just racism, it's also sexism, and they come together, and they just kind of shit on black women all the time, we make a word for it, right? We have all sorts of, you know, ways to 
work around and translate an entire thing that's happening. And every marginalized population has it, and it's a value. And it usually gets picked up when enough people are talking about it, but then suddenly it winds up in Teen Vogue without any attribution. <laughs> And it becomes the new it thing, you know, woke, right? Everyone's woke now, but they're not. <laughs> because that became a cool word after having been said for eons, you know, in black liberation culture. So many of these things we're doing, these are words you're going to be valuing in the future. You could be ahead of the curve by actually publishing the voices that are saying them now working with them and respecting them and understanding that they're coming up with new and ingenious ways of communicating something that has been withheld from the greater language in general. We could have been talking about something like misogyny more for a very long time. It goes very well with intersectionality, another word created by a black woman to describe a very complex term that we can now use to cut to the heart of an issue. Right? And these are words that could have been adopted much earlier. We could have been moving on to bigger and better things, coming up with even better words for future issues, working through them. Yeah, and don't be afraid of new words. And when's the last time you, know, you published something that you didn't fully get? You know? Hi, go ahead. No. And you have a question? Oh, it might not. Well, just two comments. Maybe not so profound, but um, definitely in our publication, I think there's this. Um, tendency to not want to publish younger voices because they're not enough ex they're not experienced enough so they might not have as much to contribute and I think that's really harsh actually to think about it because it's anyways it's just something that I've been thinking about a bit in, in our own publication so there's age and then just thinking about language my my father-in-law is French Canadian and he came to visit uh, this summer with his brother so they're both French primary, but they speak in English together with a very heavy French accent and sometimes French words. And I asked him, I said, well, like, what are you guys speaking together? Like, aren't you speaking French together? Because when you hear them speak English, you would think it would be much easier for them to be speaking in French, but they, that's, they speak English with their French language accent and with French words mixed in. And it's just an interesting concept to think about how we just how that language also is probably reflective of their mm -hmm. experience in itself, right? Like, mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah, and to consider the stretch that they're making day in and day out, yeah. right? I had actually, in, in college, I had a professor who was an Africanist, an African studies professor who yeah. was French yeah. and then learned all of her English in the UK. And so she would speak in English with this very strong, like, Cockney accent, mm -hmm. and then she would switch to French when she couldn't think of a word. And she was like, look, I'm pretty sure you're just going to be able to figure out what I'm saying. And so it was Cockney accent, French, and then advanced African studies all mixed together. And you know what? We got it. Yeah. We did. <laughs> like, we just didn't like, oh, I get that. And occasionally would be like, wait, wait, no, I don't think that. That's a word we can figure out. And then she would talk through it. But for the most part, it was fine. Yeah. I'm talking about age is interesting too because I do think that younger voices, right, they're oftentimes at the forefront of creating new ways of saying things, especially nowadays that really people can't afford to go to college <laughs> the way they used to. Um, people are working their way around in very creative and ingenious ways. Um, and I've taught high school seniors and college freshmen. Um, I, and it's amazing the amount of insight they have. Not only the amount of insight they have, but kind of just this like, like they get a lot of things that even I at 36 have aged out of, yeah. right? Um, and we do end up talking about things like the Kardashians a lot. But also like they can explain to me what Snapchat is because I don't know. And they get that and they can work through it. And I'm like, you know what? All these weird think pieces that we have on pop culture would be so much better if someone who actually engages in these technologies and in this world and knows what these beefs actually mean was writing about it. Instead of like me trying to do my best impersonation of a 17 year old who's beefing with another D-level celebrity on social media, right? I, I don't know. And we forget, right, that, the, that these people still have very legitimate 
things to say. It's not necessarily that we all get wiser with age. I know some fools who are very old. We get different perspectives, but it doesn't mean the perspective we used to have was less important. We become invested in different things. You know, we're maybe a little less free to be creative. But you know, we look at that and a lot of people don't want to take a risk on younger writers, writers who have been published a lot. A lot of times they look at it and go, oh, I just don't see enough, you know. And it's not as if we just, it's not as if the young population doesn't exist. That's the thing I don't understand. Any other sin of the population we go, we wouldn't go, well, you know, we just, there's not enough for, you know, that's a lived experience. Why would you not want young people offering a younger person's perspective on what's happening in the world? They live and are impacted by these things. <laughs> they are a group of the population that deserves a voice, but people don't really want to take a risk on that. Any other, yeah? Um, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about your experience when you were, so you were writing for yourself, mm -hmm. like on your blog, and um, then, you know, editors and publications started to see that, and then did they come to you and say, hey, could you, would you want to write something like that, or were they asking to reprint? I'm just asking because the publication that I work for doesn't have a great budget for paying people, like, for paying for content, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of what we do is like, you know, we'll reprint things or we'll pay a stipend or occasionally there's like, you know, one investigative journalist that will like pay properly. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm kind of up against, like I've only been there for a couple of years. So <clears throat> like I'm really pushing, I'm trying to push to get like more diverse voices and yet like I am aware of you know, like if I'm looking for um, a young indigenous writer to write something for us, like I don't want to, I think I'm almost like much less comfortable to say, hey, can you do this for a crappy wage than I would be to a white person. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like there's a lot of history and everything. And so, yeah, I think I feel like I'm in this zone where I'm like, how do I approach people to get that content? when I don't have the money, or what, would it, what was it like for you, or were people asking you for reprints? Or oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, and people ask me still all the time for reprints of anything I write. I still keep a blog because I like a place where I don't have to go through the editing process, you know, occasionally. I'm like, I just want this to go up today. Um, and I do not allow anyone to republish my work for free unless it's for charity or if it's for something like that I truly believe in, like for a friend that I know like just doesn't have the budget, I really want, you know, this piece there. Um, and I do that because I do believe that a lot of publications really do take advantage, especially of writers of color in that way. A lot of times they will save their staff jobs for white writers, and then they will try and cash in on the popularity of some voices of color by trying to republish work that they already know will be successful. Huffington Post being a huge, huge player in that, I know, <laughs> Huffington Post. I mean, they will literally be like, oh, you know, we would like to republish this piece, it'll get you good publicity. I'm like, it has a million views on my book. What publicity are you trying to give me for free? You know, you must have money. Uh, I know, oh, they sold for a lot of money. But I think they keep that money by not paying writers. They have a couple of staff writers whose job, I think, is really just to copy people's tweets and aggregate them into articles and then they republish. Um, and when I first started, you know, I definitely allowed a couple of people to do that just to get my name out there. But I would definitely say, if you have the budget to pay something, pay something. Always be upfront about it, don't make writers ask. Um, and fully explain what, why your budget is what it is. And explain if you don't think it's enough that you don't think it's enough but it's where you are. A lot of times what ends up happening is people reach out to you and then they won't tell you how much it pays and then you have to ask and then they'll act kind of offended that you asked and then they'll tell you it's nothing or it's $25 and then they'll be like, and it's an amazing opportunity. I'm like, look, just say it's crap. You know it's crap. That's why you didn't tell me when you emailed me. Like if we can look at the situation that it is, at least I'm going to respect you more. If I know that you have a budget of $500 a month with which to publish all of your pieces and you're trying to get a diverse array of pieces, I'm going to respect that a lot more than you trying to act like I'm getting a good deal. And so I would say, you know, definitely 
I would, what I, here's a couple of things I would say. There is definite value to a lot of places that have lower budgets and are still willing to pay and work and edit new writers, especially new writers of color, because so few of those places exist. And they would definitely make sure that you are trying to kind of make up for that in a way, not only with promotion, but also being very lax with, of course, reprint rights, if they want to ever take that anywhere else as well. And, you know, to, to make sure that it's something that they can continue to benefit from, even if you don't have the ability. And make sure that you're editing well. You know, a lot of times I find the payoff is, hey, if you can still get a really good editor that's going to give you insight when you're first getting started and really good feedback, you get a little bit of money for your work, and you get to add that to your, you know, general links when you're pitching other places, sometimes that can really be worth it if you're starting but usually only if you don't try and lie to them and make it seem like worse. But definitely still reach out to writers of color. There are writers of color who just, who are looking for any place to get published, but they don't like being lied to and being asked like, you're doing them a favor, right? And knowledge they're still doing you a favor, right? And they're still, you know, giving their work at far less than it's worth. And you know that, and you're grateful for that, right? There's a difference between those. You know, even our budget over at the establishment, which is uh, 125 US, is low. But it's still actually average or above average for a lot of online publications. It's 125 US per piece? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, because there's just no money in online budget, budgeting, right? But we're very open with, God, we would absolutely love to be able to pay more. Not, you should be glad that you're getting your, you know? Um, and to just be open with it, you know, and I would say that's a really good way. And also look at younger writers, you know, and I would also say don't reserve higher budget for bigger names. If, if you have a low budget and you're looking at diversifying, make that your focus. You know, don't be like, oh, we have a thousand bucks this month to give out to writers. We're reserving 500 in case someone with a bigger name comes along. You know, people recognize that difference. If I see a publication that's offering, you know, me 75 bucks and then they publish like Roxanne Gay the next week and they try and tell me 75 bucks is all they got for a writer, I know they're lying. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions or comments? I was working on a publication as an editor and I received a piece that was written like really casually. It was about social media and like the effect it has on your life. Uh, so I just kind of edited it like normal and then the writer got back to me saying like, oh actually like I want you to publish it as it is or not at all. And I just put it in there. <laughs> but it was like a big decision to make and it kind of opened my eyes like, mm -hmm. oh, sometimes you do have to let that space like for especially emerging um, of color art, like artists and writers, like just to kind of put it in there and have faith. Mm -hmm. It's like that it's their voice, and so I, I thought that your talk was really awesome. Just like, and I do have a moment of hope too. My friend is from. Uh, I took a writing criticism course, and my friend is from the Bahamas, and she wrote a review in her dialect. And she got an A. Nice. <laughs> so I thought that was awesome. Um, and that was kind of like a moment of hope, but it, it, it is a big question, like, would an editor see that and be like, oh no, it doesn't really fit into the, like, the way that we usually do reviews, or? Yeah, definitely, and I think that it's important to recognize a couple of things in there that are crucial. One is, um, w I think it's, it's really important as editors to be very clear and to always be giving your writers input into the editing process. There are definite times where I have gotten drafts back and I was like, absolutely not. Like, if you, I will pull this whole piece. And I have pulled pieces. I have completely pulled pieces and forfeited commission because I cannot have the way in which things were changed when it didn't even look like my writing anymore, right? Um, and there is, of course, a middle way, right? I don't assume that every writer is right, but I do think that there's always room for dialogue. And in fact, some of the best pieces I ever published um, not only for how I feel about them, but for how they were responded to, were pieces where we had, that came out of conflict between me and editors in that translation. Um, I wrote a piece a couple years ago when Beyonce came out with Lemonade. That piece came out because an editor reached out to me because, you know, when Beyonce does something, you reach out to your black writers, right? Your friends, right? Yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, Actually, my friend just ran into someone, and um, he's black, and 
this lady was like, do you know so-and-so, this rapper? And he's like, oh, yeah, he's great. He's like, no, no, do you actually know him? He's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, but a lot of people were focusing on certain aspects of Beyonce's Lemonade, which was, did Jay-Z actually cheat on Beyonce? I could care less if Jay-Z actually cheated on Beyonce. And in fact, I felt it was kind of insulting to the work of art, because this is a body of art. It is not Beyonce's diary. It's a body of art, right? So I had gotten a call, um, and it was very much an editor kind of in their wheelhouse of, we're going to get a hot take on whether or not Jay-Z cheated on Beyonce. And this is where I talk about why editorial diversity is important, right? Because that's not the hot take that it, a lot of women of color, black women especially, who are connecting to that piece of work had, right? And I was so frustrated already. I had already spent the entire morning on Facebook bitching about how I did not care about this aspect and I was so tired of seeing all these articles. And then I get a call from a major publication asking if I want to write about Jay-Z's affair. And I was like, absolutely not. <laughs> and it was from me saying no and like being so adamant about it. And everyone was like, whoa, 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 you seem really upset about this. <laughs> Why? And I was like, because I was literally like, nope, ask someone else. I will have nothing to do with that. This is not, you know, what I want to focus on. And like, I was, I had it. I, I wasn't even trying to be polite about it. And uh, so I explained to her, like, you know, what this piece actually means to black women and how frustrating it is to see this conversation be skewed in a way by people who aren't even personally connected to it. You know, to people who listened to it, felt no connection and just wondered, hmm, I wonder if he really is cheating. Whereas this was a piece that was finally making so many black women feel visible for the first time in the pain and the burden that they carry through life. She was giving voice and vision to it, right? Being a visual album. And so she was like, oh, oh right then. And it was like the most successful piece they had all year. Another example was when I was supposed to do a movie review for Suffragette, and I went and saw it, and I was just exhausted. I was so tired of, like, I'm watching this entire movie of the Suffragette movement, and there's not a single person of color in the film. Even though there were active people of color in the Suffragette movement. There was, like, an Indian princess, like, from India, in the UK, who was active and, like, risked all of her privilege to be a part of the suffragette movement, completely gone. Nobody existed. I think occasionally someone was like cleaning a window somewhere. And not only that, like to add insult to injury, the main character they made up. So they couldn't imagine a person of color in the film, but they could make up a whole new main character and she was a white woman to kind of consolidate the white vision and pain and struggle in this one vessel. So I was supposed to do a review of it and I watched it and I could barely get through it. And then I was just like, I don't, I really don't want to. And I was putting it off and putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. And then it was running, it was going to be late. And I just had to email my editor saying, I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm really, I'm not going to do it. I, I'm, I know this puts you in the bind. If you want me to write up something quick to get to print, because this was a print publication, so it is kind of shitty to be like, I'm not going to write this, because then they have this 700 word gap in their publication. Um, and the editor's like, why don't you want to, I mean, you saw the movie, and I was just like, look, I just, I really can't legitimize another film that's working so hard to actively erase people of color. And I, it wasn't just, oh, I did the film, I even interviewed the director, like, and I was just like, no, I just don't want to do it. <laughs> I did all this work, and I was still willing to just, I was just exhausted. And he was like, okay, well, write that. So what I wrote instead was, why I will not be writing a review of Suffragette. And that piece, it was interesting because I actually heard from a lot of like Hollywood actors of color who were like, don't tell anyone, oh my God, you have no idea. One, one person wrote me from a television show where he had been, that show had no characters of color and he was the first character of color and they made him mute. He's like, I'm the first character of color in years on the show, and I don't actually get to speak. Is that progress? <laughs> I don't know. I'm like, I don't know. And he was like, just, you know, he was like, I really appreciate you not legitimizing this and calling, you know, not saying, oh, you know, this is problematic, but I'm still going to review it anyway as if this deserves a review. And maybe we just decide these things don't deserve reviews anymore. 
Maybe they just don't deserve that legitimizing attention anymore. Maybe we you know, continue to focus on projects that are trying to actually see the diversity, the true diversity of our history. <laughs> Um, you know, but those are things that came out of that conflict and it came out of editors being willing to listen and see that they might be missing something in the picture. And that was a great opportunity, not, you know, not only for me, but for them. These were pieces that did incredibly well for them and had them emailing me almost immediately asking if there was anything else I was really mad about that I wanted <laughs> to write about. You know, and it's in that that you find something rare. One thing that it's almost like it's more culturally acceptable to talk about racism than it is about inequality financially. Mm -hmm. The March on Washington over 50 years ago was about jobs. And when Martin Luther King started talking about jobs, they killed him. They could, it was almost like, you know, you get down to it, it's like the invaders, the, when the English invaded Wales, they made speaking Welsh against the law and they punished school kids by giving them the Welsh knot. Do you know that little bit of history? They took on a noose and they put it around a schoolboy's neck or a schoolgirl's neck, mostly schoolboys because the girls weren't going to school much then. And if that person thought, because it was put on his neck because he was speaking Welsh, which, and, um, but if he found another schoolboy speaking Welsh, he could take it off his neck and put it on the other person's neck, and then on Friday afternoon, whoever had the noose on their neck would be caned. Well, they practiced that there, and then they brought it over here. It was illegal to speak First Nations languages on the West Coast here. The potlatch was uh, banned. So there's all that history mm -hmm. about taking people's language away, taking their power away. Mm -hmm. yeah, I just want to mention that. Yeah. We uh, are on unseen territory yes. here, of course. Most definitely. And, uh, the, the language has almost died out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's interesting to see the way in which we have to remember, like, the way in which we structure our language today as acceptable language has been built upon the back and on a lot of pain and silencing of other languages, not only from a cultural perspective, but also from a class perspective, right? And, and, and power and money. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and what's interesting, too, is what you'll find is as more language gets popularized, um, you'll find it, it will become blacklisted because there is a certain elitism to publishing and there are certain things that once they become too popular they become, there's a reason why like my friends are you know called bloggers instead of writers because their language is too popular um, and I do think that when we look at class we can look at that as well I think it's always important to to remember that when we talk about whether it is race or whether it is class that those things commingle and they commingle and amplify each other in many ways. So there are plenty of areas where you are very safe to talk class but never race. There are plenty of areas where you can talk race but only if that comes through a certain class lens. They work together and they work differently, right? So there's a reason why you will find poverty in a lot of First Nations populations and that reason is going to be different than why you will find poverty in old industrial towns in white neighborhoods. The impact often ends up looking the same on a class basis, right? But the problems and the solutions are going to be quite different and we have to elevate all of it so that we can have a more comprehensive solution. I have a lot of friends who try and who say that like a lot of times, well, why don't you write more about class instead of race? I say, well, I write about both, but I am a black woman, which means that if you ask me why I grew up poor, the reasons why I grew up poor are going to be different from the reasons why you grew up poor. And if we try and make it so that you are less poor, the impact that's going to have on my life is going to be very minuscule because the reasons why I am poor are different from the reasons why you are poor. The machinery has the same aim, but it pulls different levers to achieve those goals. And that's part of the reason why we have to be open to listening to people and all of their lived experiences. Because if we say we want a piece on class, but we're not looking, and we're looking at poverty, but we're not looking at all of the different ways that people are brought to poverty, and there are very many different ways. If you are a disabled the reasons why you are poor oftentimes have a lot more to do with you know, discrimination in jobs, lack of accessibility. If you live in the States, it's health care and the fact that you literally, it's $20,000 to get the equipment you need to survive and no one helps you for it. If you are black and you came up, it has to do with the fact that if you have a black sounding name, no one will interview you for a job. 
you have four times less likely to even get called for an interview, um, that you're likely to have been suspended from school, kicked out of school, or even arrested in school. Chances are you are raising a grandchild if your son happens to be the one in three black men sent to prison, right? If you are a Pacific Islander, chances are you are poor because you have been incredibly forgotten thanks to the model minority myth, which assumes that all Asian Americans are doing wonderfully and doesn't actually provide any programs for those who aren't. And if you're poor and you grew up in a coal mining town and that industry's gone and you're white, you're poor for very many different reasons and you're going to feel unseen and unheard as these conversations seem to act like the American dream is if you just work hard enough, you will be a success. Right? And so all of these things when we talk about class, right, that's why it's important to always be open. We think that we're accomplishing these goals because we look at it through our lens and go, that's a good story about poverty. And we don't realize who's missing. And in this work, when we open up and realize that there's so much that we may not know, we ourselves come out with such an amazing experience. The things I know, I know because I have been fortunate enough that people have been generous with their experience with me. The things I don't know yet, other things that I oftentimes haven't realized I'm missing and I need to go seek out and I need to, you know, and I'm going to feel kind of bad when I realize I've been missing these major pieces <laughs> as long as I have, but I'm still going to be grateful for the opportunity and it will make me a better writer and a better editor. It will help me, it will help all of my work I do in social justice be better and it'll make me a better neighbor and a better mom and, a, you know, better everything. And I want to read these things. I want to log on to my favorite websites and find a perspective, a first-hand perspective on an issue I thought I knew and find out I knew nothing about it. I lived for that. And I think we all need to as well. We need to stop trying to, re to just validate what we already know and look for the opportunities to realize how little we know. That's growth for us. It's growth for our industry. That's the thing that shines like a light in this digital age when we are flooded with useless crap. Something new, a new twist on what you thought you knew is what people flock to, right? There's a reason why writers like ta Coates, people are just blown away. He's not just talking new things, but he's putting a new perspective that you hadn't been introduced to, right, in the Atlantic. And that's what we need to be looking for. We need to be looking for the ways in which our own minds are blown as writers and editors. And then we can give that to our audience and they will respond. And it, it's the, I think, I really do believe that in this age where we already have bots that are willing to make, you know, whatever confirmation bias you need, they're willing to write it up in a fake news story and publish it. And no one knows what to trust anymore. Nothing shines truer than authentic firsthand experience. You can recognize that from the fake news any day. We just have so little of it that we don't know we're missing it. Look at your stories tonight. Look at your news. Just log on to your local news channel and see how often the voices of these stories actually come from the people being reported about. Ask what's missing and then you'll see. It will blow your mind. I mean, just watching local news, you'll be like, are you serious? This is all that's happening in my town? Really? And this is the perspective for it. And realize how many good opportunities you could have to actually interest people and invest people in these stories. You have to always be aware of that, but also recognize your audience will recognize it and appreciate it and pay for it. Authenticity. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, well, we are at time. Can I just say something? Yeah. I'm actually concerned that that authenticity is actually what's inappropriate. Like, even when I was thinking of that Pepsi commercial, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's a bit where, the, where there's a girl in a hijab and she sees, oh, yeah, everyone, everyone's protesting, and that's suddenly that's the <laughs> purpose. And she's like, oh, yeah, and then she's in on the Pepsi joke. So it's that authenticity that's being taken away from the writing impulse and made commercial in a sense that's really where. You know, I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think the one thing that actually made me happy about that, because it is such a classic exploitation, right, was how quickly, because we have so many people who have kind of taken the microphone on that, it was recognized as fake. How quickly that insulted people. Five years ago, it wouldn't have insulted anyone. It would have been seen as groundbreaking. Oh my God, they have someone in a job, in this commercial, and everyone, I mean, the moment 
I was just like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? <laughs> are you kidding me? And I think that that's why it's really important that we keep offering up examples that are authentic. Because if we don't give something for people to compare to, they won't know. Right? If there aren't enough first person voices actually sharing their experience, and luckily there were a lot of you know, Muslim women who were able to immediately push back and say, absolutely not. But I think that we have to make sure that we aren't legitimizing that or that we're not just offering up silence in response. Mm -hmm. If you have the opportunity to offer up legitimate, authentic experience and you choose to offer nothing instead, you're doing nothing to counter those who are going to try and profit off of it. But I think it is really important to remember that people have to have those authentic experiences to compare to. They have to see it as it is for real. And I do think, of course, we also need to be constantly calling out exploitation and people that try and pretend to be it. But it is easier to do when you have something to compare it to. Right? It's a lot easier to do when you actually have authentic voices who can say, no, this is absolutely wrong. Instead of people just guessing. And you know, I would say probably pre-social media, no, people would have been giving all the awards to that Pepsi commercial <laughs> as something that was just, you know, wonderful. They didn't have to show brown people in this commercial, and they did, right? It would have just been fine. And that's probably happened because when there's people like us in this room writing that advert, right? It's creative people mm -hmm. writing that sort of commercial advert. So it's just so much class. Yeah, and that's part of the reason why if you don't have the people in the room and you're not going to the source, which is why I, I talk so strongly about you can't interpret for people, like you actually need to go to the source and have them give their experience. Not you going, I, you know, I have a friend who's Latinx, pretty sure I can write this Latinx character. How can they still keep making the same mistakes? Like mistakes though, there must be, as you say, people in the room that it's surely, like the Pepsi, the dog ad, just recently on Facebook, there was something from the National Post about all the corn pops being white and one corn pop being brown, and that was the janitor. And I couldn't believe all the comments mm -hmm. saying, I don't know why this is offensive, it's just cereal. It's really easy when everyone in the room has your same experience. And that's part of the reason why the first thing I always bring up is who's making these editorial decisions. Right? Because a lot of times what you're doing is you're offering opportunities to diverse voices once you've already decided what that opportunity is going to look like. Mm. Right? And then you're already limited. Right? If you're saying, I have this great idea for a commercial, now I need, now I'm going to bring in actors of color. Like you, you started off wrong. I was just saying out there, my, one of my analogies for this is if you bake a cake with poison ingredients, it's going to be a poison cake and you can't then just frost it at the end and say you fixed it. Right? And it has to start from inception. And a lot of times we lose what we even think is a good story. Right? What we think would be a good story is so limited by our lived experience that if we aren't even acknowledging that there are things we don't know and we aren't reaching out and trying to ask questions, we're going to keep making these mistakes. And you can't just work it at the end and say, I've built no diversity into my process, into my writing, and I'm still going to try and cash in on this. And you can try and avoid that, and that's halfway good to just not do harm. But you're still part of a system that does harm, which means you have to go beyond that and actively work to publish better and do better. Not just, I'm not going to royally screw this up, but I'm going to actively work to be a part of the solution and not the problem. And this is not a charity thing. I really hope you guys understand this. No one will give you cookies for this. This is what you should be doing because it is good writing, because it is responsible writing, because it is ethical writing and publishing, because it's better for your industry, and because you have benefited from a system that has kept amazing writers and editors out. You have benefited at their expense. Your work has been elevated above theirs, and it may not actually be better than theirs. You have a debt to pay, and you shouldn't expect thanks. It's what you should do if you care about your work. You care about the integrity of your work, and you want it to be better. And you want it to actually serve its audience, right? Fundamentally, especially if you're writing in magazines and journalism, you are writing for an audience. You have a responsibility to your audience. You may not have questioned who you think your audience is, and you should. Because I doubt that many people would say, I only write for white dudes. But you write like you do, and you edit like you do, 
and you publish like you do. If you're not willing to put it on your masthead, you should investigate that and actually change so that your actions work accordingly. But yes, I do think that there is an effort, especially as things get, as authentic voices are rewarded and become profitable, mm -hmm. there will always be an effort for people who want to skip and just want to ice that cake. <laughs> and be like, yeah. And I really hope that if you come out of this and think that all you need to do is occasionally have a black person write about black things or have a First Nations person write about First Nations thing and you've done your part, you haven't especially if you think you can do it without paying them. Right? All you're doing is kind of trying to ice that cake. You're going to have to fundamentally look at how you are structuring language, how you are reaching out to people, what you are valuing, and why. Right? Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Okay.